Somehow, some way, the Carolina Panthers still are in contention in the NFC South heading into their bye week at 4-8. and eight. We'll look at the road ahead for the Panthers and what position groups need to step up if they indeed want to find a way to repeat 2014 here in Carolina. We'll break it all down right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to watch our show and subscribe to our show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. We're following every Carolina Panthers game and any breaking news. I am there live on the Locked On Panthers YouTube channel. If you ever miss a live episode, that's okay. You can find every Every single episode of the show wherever you listen to your favorite podcast just be sure to rate review and subscribe so you never miss a single edition of the locked on panthers podcast and be sure to follow me julian council on twitter at julian council where every single friday unless there's a holiday i answer your weekly friday mailbag questions here on the show to participate in this week's edition of the weekly friday mailbag either at me or dm me on twitter at julian council the carolina panthers head into the bye week at four and eight Coming off of their 23 to 10 beatdown of the Denver Broncos, who look awful. We've sat here and we've complained about Matt Rule, rightfully so. We've complained about what this offense is trying to accomplish and the defense sometimes wearing down and letting up late in games, but it could always be worse. You could have given up a war chest for Russell Wilson at 33 years old. And as soon as he gets to your organization, he looks washed. He's not cooking anymore. Russ is cooked in Nathaniel Hackett. The guy said when he got in the building there, he thought that, oh, man, I can't believe they let me in here, like joking around. And I'm honestly thinking about it. It could not have been a joke because clearly Nathaniel Hackett has no business ever being a head coach of any NFL team the rest of his football coaching career because it has been an unmitigated disaster up there in Denver. So it could always be worse, and it certainly has been like that here in Carolina. but. Recently, the vibes, at least following a win, because as we know, it's win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. At least that's how it's gone uh, through the better part of the first seven weeks of the Steve Wilkes era, in the interim era, I, I should say here in Carolina, as Wilkes is three and four overall as the interim head coach and is three and oh, having won three straight home games here in Carolina. And we're having the conversation yesterday. I'm sure we'll have it down the road if he keeps winning and that's the key, because I understand, like you, I would love to see Steve Wilkes get this job. And I know plenty of players in that locker room would also love to see the interim tag taken off. We've seen that these guys follow Steve Wilkes. And when Matt Rule, who was introduced at Nebraska on Monday, did his press conference, I watched a little bit of it. It's always funny to me how a guy can be absolutely loathed in his past stop. But as soon as he gets to a next stop, people are adoring him, all the adulation. Hope is a powerful drug, man. And the people in Lincoln, Nebraska certainly have it for Matt Rule. But I remember Matt Rule last week talking about how he wishes he would have been able to connect with his players better back in 2020 during the pandemic when they're having to wear masks and all the COVID protocols. And even last season, it wasn't until the end of last year, really this past offseason where he got to connect. Well, I understand that, but we've seen Steve Wilkes in really less than seven weeks be able to connect with these players. And they've talked about it, whether it's been Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, Brian Burns, Jeremy Chin, several players have come out and said his straightforward nature. They really respect it about him. Just letting people know, hey, this is a situation when he's going week to week trying to figure out who the quarterback's going to be. He has all three of them, PJ, Baker, Sam, in that meeting room. And he's letting them know who's starting, who's the backup, and who's inactive. He ain't beating around the bush at all here in Carolina. And that kind of shows you the leadership. That Steve Wilkes has brought here to Carolina through the past seven games at that three and four record. He needs to still win more games, I think, to get this job. And certainly what he has to do is make it to the point where David Tepper cannot hire him. Like there's no if he makes it to the point where David Tepper can't do that, 
then he'll be the Panthers head coach. And also, if Steve Wilkes takes his team to the playoffs and he doesn't get the job, go ahead and add David Tepper's name to the lawsuit because there's something wrong with that. If this man can galvanize that locker room in 13 weeks, get them to the playoffs when they struggle and have so many inefficiencies, that is a great coaching job if he ends up doing it. So far, I think he's done an excellent job, but the wins and losses are what matter most here in Carolina. And I'm looking at the remaining schedule, and I'm thinking there might be an opening. And I know you're all probably saying, Julian, you're so wishy-washy. One week you're like, oh, they're going to be a top five pick. Next week you're like, hey, maybe it might happen. Well, when a Sunday like we had this past Sunday happens, and it opens back the door for Carolina to potentially be right there one game out, where they're one and a half currently, a Tampa Bay by next time to get out there and play um, in Seattle in two weeks, then it's kind of hard not to have a conversation because the division is so bad. And as I've always said throughout the season, the NFC South will allow the Panthers in the division race into December because not a single one of these teams is very good this season. But let's break down a little bit of what Steve Wilkes had to say during his uh, day after press conference as the Panthers head into the bye week. The players will have the entire week off because it's so late. He did say, depending on when it occurs, like back in Arizona, I forget when it was, but he would sometimes have the guys practice. And I know it's only been one other time he's been a head coach, but he would have him practice, had it been earlier, but because they played 12 straight weeks, going to let guys get away be around their family. Same thing with the coaches. And you wonder from the coaching standpoint, seeing Terrence Knight and the assistant defensive line coach follow Matt Rule to Lincoln. You seeing the other strength coach also do that as well. If there are going to be any sort of issues there and Wilkes said, no, he doesn't think that they're going to bring anybody in. He said from a standpoint, he thinks they can handle it right now. But if he does feel like they need to bring somebody else in, then they'll do that. Of course, I've seen fans who have clamored for Luke Keekley. Um, not quite sure if that is even a possibility, but if it happens, great. If it doesn't, Great. Not really too concerned about that either way. I know a few of us might have been taken aback by Steve Wilkes going ahead and naming Stan Darnold the starter going into Seattle. I thought it was the right decision to make. Go ahead and make it now. Let's not sit around here and wait after the bye week and name Sam. Let's not sit here and wait and see what happens with PJ. Sam played a really good game on Sunday. I know the numbers are on eye-popping, 11 for 19, about 164 yards, a touchdown, another one rushing, didn't turn the ball over. He could have done it. Had Josie Jewell been able to hold on to the football or gotten that when he stripped him at the goal line or someone else from Denver fell on the ball. But Sam got the ball, rolled right into the end zone, stop, drop, touchdown. And I, I, I like to see that. And I like to see a more under control Sam. And Sam talked about how it took him a little bit of time to really get comfortable. But we saw it, especially on that touchdown drive after the fake uh, the fake um, punt on that fourth and one where he was four for four for 39 yards and a touchdown and a beautiful throw to DJ Moore with pressure in his face, just kind of sitting back there and floating it over to him. And of course, the throw down the sideline later on, we saw the Sam Darnold that a lot of people hoped that he would be when he got to Carolina. And of course, folks up in New York with the Jets hope that he would be. He has the talent. He's just never been able to put it together. And we'll see if for five more games, he can do that and what that means for his future here in Carolina or elsewhere. I've already gotten questions for the mailbag on Friday as far as, hey, what happens if Sam plays this team in a playoff contention and actually gets them there? What do you do? We just got to wait and see, folks. We got to wait and see. And I would love for that to happen. I've been critical of Sam Darnold, but I want the guy to succeed. I don't want the guy to fail. It sucks that I've seen someone with immense talent be in a bad situation and not be able to overcome it. And certainly, I've said before, like, look, not everyone's going to have an ideal situation. You got to be able to make do. And he has not done that. But right now, in what seems to be, it's still not a great situation considering the amount of staff that's left, the fact that you have an interim head coach and the other issues that you have on this roster. But as far as offensive line and even some playmakers and the run game, especially, it looks like the best situation Sam Darnold's been in his entire career. And that says a lot about the situations that he faced last year in Carolina and the three previous seasons when he started off his career with the New York Jets. So um, I don't just, I don't think it's a bad decision at all to name Sam Darnold as the starter. Uh, Steve Wilkes said that it, was a, it wasn't a quick decision. Rather, it was a quick announcement to name Sam. You asked, though, what happens with the backup quarterback? Will it be Baker again in two weeks' time? Uh, Steve Wilkes, not ready to answer that question just yet, wants to wait and see when P.J. Walker is back up and healthy. And I imagine when P.J. is healthy, the Panthers sound pretty done with Baker. We all know the implications that Baker plays as far as the conditions and with the draft pick. Even if he plays another game or a couple snaps, I don't think it's really going to impact too much of the uh, 70% quarterback snaps. But uh, I don't see much reason why we should see Baker Mayfield out there, especially when PJ and his what four or five starts and then Sam and his lone start have both looked miles better than Baker Mayfield has looked at any point this season as the Panthers quarterback. So we'll see how that plans out. Also, no commitment past Seattle with Sam Darnold. He's going to be the guy. 
when we see them play out in Seattle in a couple weeks. And then after that, depending on how he plays, Steve Wilson going to make a decision after that. So we'll see how that all plays out. Um, other things to Shai Smith, who missed some time last week due to illness and then wasn't the uh, starting punt returner as Raheem Blackshear, who you'll note will also muff the punt that led to the only first half points in the Denver Broncos on Sunday. That sounds like Shai Smith will be back at returner. Steve Wilkes said as much on Monday when speaking to the media, saying that because Shai missed some time, particularly the day when the Panthers brought in the left-footed punter, he didn't want to put Shai out there and in a bad situation. We did see Shai later on in the game. We also did see Raheem Blackshear another time, but it'll be Shai Smith returning punts for the Panthers when they get out there to Seattle. And we're thinking about wins. What do they have to do to win? Keep up the momentum. At least, you know, build on it. Because Steve Wilkes has said, we need to do something that we have not done all season long. We can do that against Seattle. Went on the road win back-to-back -back games, what they need to do that, do to, in order to continue to be able to do that. It's that they need to have the offensive line play like it's played for the last six weeks, especially on Sunday against Denver where they rushed for 185 yards and they need the secondary to play well where they did. Seeing Sam Franklin, a guy stepping up, coming in, making a play on that first play of the game. Jimmy Chin played well. JC Horn was excellent. That's what they need moving forward for this team to continue to win. Of course, Sam Darnold make the right decisions or whoever's playing quarterback and – Brian Burns, who has 10 sacks, first time in his career, right on track to be another pro bowler. Keep doing what you're doing, man, because we need it for five more games, and the Panthers want to have any chance of being a playoff team. And speaking of the playoffs, had uh, one of our listeners DM me, and sometimes, like I've told y'all, if I get a good conversational piece from y'all in my DMs on Twitter, at Julian Council, I'll get into it for a segment of the show, especially – on a week like this, where it's a bye week, there will be no crossover. We'll still have the weekly Friday mailbag. As far as Wednesday show, not quite sure. Might try to do a uh, conversation. Haven't had one of those in about a month or so. So we'll see uh, what we do there plan-wise. If y'all send me something in that I think I could really spend some time on the show and not to wait till Friday, I'll do that. And one of our listeners sent me in uh, a question and kind of his own thesis in a way about, hey, what the Panthers got to do the rest of the way, five games remaining, in order to be in position to make the playoffs. And with that, I found more similarities. To that 2014 season where the Panthers went from 3-8-1 and one to 7-8-1 and one and division champs in the NFC South. We'll talk about that here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. This episode of Locked on Panthers is brought to you by our friends over at Turo. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want wherever you want it from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., UK, Canada, and coming soon to Australia. Book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip. Get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday, or holiday. Find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from point A to point B. Test drive that new electric vehicle you've had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday lifestyle. Mini Turo hosts can even deliver the car right directly to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance, terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. Hey, this has kind of been a uh, season-long exercise when the Panthers, who are in the worst division in the uh, NFL, win a game after coming off a loss. I'm kind of like, okay, um, maybe let's get back in to, uh, sorry, battling a wee bit of a cold here. But uh, I get into the conversation of, uh, hey, can the Panthers be a playoff team? Can they somehow find a way to win the division? And I had one of our listeners, Percy, who DM me on Twitter at Julian Council, where you guys can DM me in order to participate in the weekly Friday mailbag. And as I said before, if you have a good one where I'm like, hey, maybe we can talk about this during the week, I will. And that's what I'm going to do here. But Percy DM me this saying, Julian, call me crazy, but we could finish four and one losing to Seattle or Tampa and potentially take the division. Obviously, taking the Tampa game as it weighs on a division record is what you would rather have. What do you think the chances are of a 4-1 and one, or, dare I say, 5-0 and oh finish? Well, the Carolina – oh, God, what is going on? Well, the Carolina Panthers, of course, have the bye week in Week 13. Then they're at Seattle, who is 6-5. and five. They're home against Pittsburgh, who's 3-7 and seven currently. Of this recording, recording before Monday Night Football, I don't think they're going to win. I don't know who they play, but the Pittsburgh Steelers are not good. Uh, then Week 16, home against the Detroit Lions, who are 4-7, and seven, but a very competitive 4-7. and seven. At Tampa in Week 17, who's 5-6, and six, and in the division lead, one and a half games above Carolina. And, of course, at New Orleans, Week 18, who was 4-8, and eight, and starting Andy Dalton as their quarterback. Why are they doing that? I don't know. But keep doing it, because Carolina has a... I don't know. I don't really think it matters. Either way, whether it's Dalton or Jameis, that's a game the Carolina Panthers should win. So looking at this, there are similarities, as we've talked about, 
with 14 and 22. I mean, the team getting hot late in the season. Now, they have not done it yet. As I get, Again, as Steve Wilkes said, they have to go out there and win back-to-back games and win on the road. They can do that with a win in Week 14 at Seattle. But until then, kind of got to put things on pause. But as far as just the record the Carolina Panthers had around this time in 2014 compared to what they have now, it's basically the same record. Through 13 weeks in 2014, the Carolina Panthers were 3-8-1. and one. Through 13 weeks in 2022, the Carolina Panthers will be 4-8. and eight. When you look at the opponents who they beat to win four straight games, get the 7-8-1, and, and go to the playoffs and beat a Ryan Lindley-led Arizona Cardinals team before losing in Seattle in the divisional round, they played at a 7-9 New Orleans Saints team. They played home against a 2-14 and Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. They played at home against a 7-9 and Cleveland Browns team with Johnny Manziel as their quarterback, and then beat the brakes off the Atlanta Falcons, who were 6-10 and 10 under Mike Smith that year in 2014. Not very good teams. Those are four straight teams of a losing record. The Carolina Panthers beat on way to being in the playoffs. Now, as we'll note, there is an extra game the Carolina Panthers play, with it being 17 instead of 16, as it used to be back in 2014 and prior to the 2021 season. So, when you look at the Panthers' schedule, as I mentioned, at 6-5 and five, Seattle, home against a 3-7 and seven Pittsburgh Steelers team, a 4-7 and seven Detroit Lions team, a 5-6 and six Tampa Bay team on the road, and a 4-8 and eight New Orleans Saints team on the road. The Carolina Panthers currently have the third easiest remaining schedule ahead of them. Third easiest. And if they go 4-1, and one, and assuming the only loss is on the road at Seattle, the only winning team they play, of course, that's 8-9. and nine. And you can get a game back off of Tampa – by beating them. And I don't think New Orleans is going to surpass you. It is very possible that we can see the Panthers capitalize on yet another bad schedule. Now, the difference was back in 2014, you had Luke Keekley, you had Thomas Davis, you had a veteran defense, and you, of course, had Cameron Jarrell Newton as your quarterback. We ain't got that right now, quarterback. Whether it ends up being PJ or it's Sam or somehow Baker, that's not the case at quarterback. But the performance they got on Sunday from Sam Darnold with this defense and with this O-line and running game, and especially that secondary, and Brian Burns, brain Brian Burns, that can have them in contention to win every single one of those games. We just saw the Raiders, who stink this year. They're 4-7, and seven, one on the road, beats the out in overtime. Carolina can't do that. Josh Jacobs ran all over the Seahawks. You're telling me Deontay Foreman and Chuba Hubbard can't do the same thing in two weeks' time? to Pete Carroll in that defense, absolutely. They can win that game. But right now, for me, I got to see it. And really, to start believing in the Panthers' ability to actually do that, I've got to see them win on the road against Seattle and then follow it up, handle prosperity, and beat a bad Pittsburgh Steelers team in Week 15. If they do that, then we're looking at a 6-8 and eight football team with Detroit at home, at Tampa, at New Orleans, two critical division games to end the season. If they can win at Seattle, followed up against Pittsburgh, then I can really start to buy in. Because every time I want to buy in, and every time we have this conversation and play the schedule game, they lose. Now they got the bye week, so they can't lose to the bye. Fingers crossed. Don't want to do anything stupid. But they got to beat Seattle next week for me to really start to think about, okay, okay, that's back-to-back. They got to win on the road. Okay. Now beat Pittsburgh. You do that, you get the six and eight, and that probably puts you either tied or one game back of Tampa, a team you'll play two weeks after that. Then I can really start to buy into this being 2014 again. It's going to be tough. It ain't going to be any gimmies. We've seen the Panthers have, I mean, Arizona's no good. They lost to them. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Excuse me. I mean, looking at the schedule too, <coughs> Um. I don't have it in front of me. don't have my phone either. I'm just trying to think about who they play because, like, New Orleans is no good. They beat them. Tampa is no good. They beat them. I don't think they have a, a – they have not. No, they definitely haven't beat a single winning team so far this season. So – and they might not need to, honestly, because if they lose to Seattle, it's going to be just a bunch of teams that have losing records. And I don't think anyone in the NFC South is going to end up with a winning record. So, yeah, Cleveland losing – they lost them, has a losing record. Okay, the – the Giants, of course, have a winning record. But yeah, New Orleans, who they beat, has a losing record, four and eight. Um, Tampa, uh, who they beat, five and six, losing record. Atlanta, who they beat, uh, five and seven, losing record. Then yesterday against Denver, who's now three and eight, losing record. So the Panthers 
have been able to beat the bad teams. The only problem is they have not beaten the good teams. They're going to probably need to beat one of those good teams on the road in Seattle in a few weeks' time to really start having that conversation of, hey, hey, is it 2014 again? So we'll see how that works out. We'll take another quick pause, though, and we'll get back. And there's people out there, of course, anytime the Panthers win, especially when you look at tankathon.com wondering, oh, man, are they going to ruin their chances at a quarterback? They might not have done that so far. So we'll talk about that here in just a moment on Locked On Panthers. This episode of Locked On Panthers is brought to you by Audible. Audible is releasing a slate of new football podcasts that we're sure you're going to love. Find Block Forever now wherever you get your podcasts. And Panther fans, you especially need to listen to this podcast. Block Forever is a brand new podcast from former NFL All-Pro and a Carolina Panther, Ryan Khalil and Audible. Khalil takes conversation about football to the next level. He gives football fans an insider's look at the game through the eyes of the greatest players and personalities of all time. Khalil sits down with star players, coaches, and former pros across the league to get real about what happens on the field, behind the scenes, inside locker rooms, during team meetings, and back at the hotel. And and guess what? You'll hear from Christian McCaffrey talk about his love-hate relationship with fantasy football and even Juju Smith-Huster give his most honest opinions on other players and positions in the league. Catch the full Block Forever series available anywhere you get your podcast. Available everywhere right now. Audible, get in the game. Okay, so the Panthers win, and immediately I start getting people who are complaining about that, being like, I want to be happy that they won, but, oh, man, Julian... Their draft position, like they've dropped back from being second overall to now sixth overall. And can they still get a quarterback if this is the case? And I also have other people who are pointing out, and we'll talk more about it on the weekly Friday mailbag, at me or DM me at Julian Council, participate. Uh, I have people also DM me and be like, hey, look at all these quarterbacks right here and look at where they were drafted. None of them are drafted in the top five. So we can get that conversation later on in the week. But as far as the concern and angst, really, in this fan base surrounding that draft pick dropping from second to six with still five more games to play. Like you can't get too caught up in there. Like they won one game and they've shown the inability to a went on the road and B went back to back games. So knowing that if I were you probably wouldn't be all that concerned. I know I just pointed out how the third easiest schedule, but why would you believe right now the Carolina Panthers actually are going to capitalize on that? Like they did in 2014 and be right there in a thick division race and possibly win a division and take themselves out of position to take a Bryce Young or take a C.J. Stroud at the top of the 2023 NFL draft. Now, when I look at it currently, you look at the five teams ahead of the Carolina Panthers. The Houston Texans got a ton of picks from the Cleveland Browns, who, of course, they play this Sunday. Deshaun Watson finally coming back, eligible on Monday to go play for Cleveland against his former team in Houston on Sunday afternoon. The Texans... They benched Davis Mills and they drafted him the third round back in 2021. He was never really the answer. That was kind of a flyer. Why not see if he can be the guy? Started last year once Tyrod Taylor got injured, which seems to always be the case for Tyrod. There's a first round pick who's behind him. Then he gets injured and that guy starts to play well. Mills, not really the Justin Herbert type. And things have not gone well this year under Lovey Smith. He was benched in favor of Kyle Allen. And guess what? Kyle Allen, as we saw here in Carolina, ain't all that good either. And they were bad. He'll still be the remaining court the starter for the remainder of the season. And Houston's on their way to probably a one or two win season and being the number one pick in the draft, where they will absolutely take a quarterback. Currently, at number two would be the Chicago Bears. Um, they drafted a guy the Carolina Panthers could have taken eighth overall back in 2021 in Justin Fields. Justin Fields missed the game in New York yesterday, but he will be back at some point, and he also is the future in Chicago, at least for another two seasons. So Justin Fields, don't look at him losing his job there. The Rams, via the trade, to send um, Jared Goff over to Detroit to bring in Matthew Stafford. They swap picks. They currently have the number three pick in the draft because Detroit, not very good. The Rams also, not very good. The Rams already have Matthew Stafford. There's some issues elbow-wise. You might not play the rest of the season. We'll see how it works out. But Matthew Stafford, they just gave him a new contract extension after the Super Bowl. He's going to be their guy next season. 
And Denver, we already laughed about it earlier. We saw it firsthand on Sunday. They're stuck with Russell Wilson until like 2025, 2026. And Lord help them if y'all want to send your prayers at all out west to Denver. Because Russell, golly, you better hope it's really the head coach. This is the wide receiver injuries and the O-line also having some injuries. And it's not that this guy has really fallen off a cliff that we did not see coming at all. If you're the Denver Broncos and you're a fan of that team. But Denver, not going to be in the market for a quarterback when looking at those teams and then you got Pittsburgh who took Kenny Pickett when they probably didn't need to take Kenny Pickett and could have been this bad with Mitch Trubisky and been in a better quarterback draft but I understand the thought of hey draft your quarterback now don't wait till later because you never know what's going to happen well we'll see how Kenny Pickett works out there in Pittsburgh but right now it's been you know not great but again he's a rookie quarterback so Houston they'll take a quarterback Chicago has their quarterback the Rams have their quarterback. Denver has their quarterback, unfortunately. And Pittsburgh has their quarterback. So Carolina sitting at six, they're fine. They don't have to move from that spot unless someone behind them decides, let's trade up and go get, whether it's Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or Will Levis, if somebody else catches other people's fancy. And New Orleans is the team I guess you would be concerned about because looking at Andy Dalton, he's not the guy. Jameis Winston, they paid him to be the guy this season, and he gets hurt, and he's no longer the guy now that he's healthy. We'll see, but still not going to be the guy. New Orleans sitting right behind Carolina. Like, that's the team that stands to benefit the most from the Carolina Panthers winning games. Like, that Week 18 game to finish off the season could be for positioning of who has the ability to take that second quarterback, assuming that they all sit back tight. Now, New Orleans could trade up. With the Rams, especially a team that has given up a lot of first-round draft picks and swap spots with them, the Panthers also could benefit from that if they want to pick up some first-round, or I guess if they want to give theirs away and the Rams can pick it up. Uh, Denver, also a team that would really benefit from trading back because they've given up a ton of draft picks to bring in Russell Wilson has not worked out. Um, Pittsburgh, they already have their quarterback. They could do that, but they're a team that I think would not want to would want to use their pick. So looking at LA and Denver right now, those are two teams who absolutely are probably going to be looking to get out of that position, knowing that they have their quarterbacks under massive contracts for the next four or five years, and they could benefit to stand from getting some first-round picks from a Carolina or New Orleans. So really what the, what's happening is not necessarily the Panthers are taking themselves out of position to take a quarterback. They're putting themselves in the position where they're going to have to trade up and give up assets to get that quarterback. That's what they decide to do here come the draft in April. So again, don't be too caught up in it. I've said it multiple times. You should rather this team win football games and actually look competent than them being downright awful and being in the top 10. Because look who's in the top 10. Houston. Or top three, rather. Houston. They're terrible. Um, Chicago. They're terrible. And Detroit, again, not great, but that's the Rams pick. Like, you don't want to be in that position right now. Or I guess that Rams pick goes to Detroit. So, uh, I don't. well, does it go to Detroit? I don't know. But either way, the Panthers... <laughs> Might have to trade up. They're fine. Just keep winning games. That's what I would suggest because that's what I want to see is a team that's in the playoffs, that's playing good football. And also, that would mean Steve Wilkes would be your head coach. You got to find head coach anyways before you decide what to do at quarterback. So we'll see how it pans out here over the next five weeks. The Panthers have, again, the third weakest schedule moving forward here in the NFL. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, guys, make sure to watch the show, subscribe to the show over on our Locked On Panthers YouTube channel where we go live following every Panthers game and anytime there's any breaking news out there. Also, you can check out the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. Just be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss a single episode. And follow me on Twitter at Julian Council for every single Friday answer weekly Friday mailbag questions. Participate on this week's edition of Weekly Friday Mailbag, either at me or DM me on Twitter at Julian Council. In the meantime, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Wednesday.